to be with you again today. Again, my name is AJ. I'm the campus pastor here. Uh, we've been going through a series on the book of Colossians, um, and uh, we've been steadily going through it, and then we find that there's a ton to unpack about our lives uh, and how we can follow Jesus each and every day of our lives uh, as we go through the small things and the big things. Uh, today we're talking a little bit about kids and parents to start off with, um, really about authority. Today's passage is just two verses uh, from Colossians 3. Um, Children, always obey your parents. This is pleasing to the Lord. I had some parents that requested this, which is why we're doing it. No. Um, fathers, don't make your children resentful or they will become discouraged. We're going to s- spend some time camping out around this passage today. Um, you know, and I, as I read this, I, I can relate having four kids now. Uh, I'm like, man, parenting can be hard sometimes, right? It can be uh, a little bit crazy. Uh, right? Especially like, I don't know about you guys, have, who ever seen like the movie Final Destination? Anyone seen that one where the guy cheats death and then death comes back for him, right? Because he cheated it. And I feel like that's me, but with kids' toys, right? Like, so I tripped over a toy at some point and almost died, but somehow I survived. And now death is coming back for me every time I step around the kids' toys everywhere. Like the other day I tripped and fell like into the corner of the dresser where that pointy part is, right? Like I survived. So I get this. I, I get, um, you know, how there can be a little bit of strife in the midst of parenting and authority. And so we're going to camp out around this today. Uh, verse 20 is where we're going to start uh, today. You're welcome to, uh, to follow along. Uh, and uh, we're going to be unpacking this. Um, so the first thing to get into is this, this parent-child uh, motif. It's just an amazing picture of God's love for us. Uh, Psalm 103 kind of highlights this uh, when it says... Um, that as a father, uh, next slide please, uh, as a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion uh, for those who fear him. Sort of comparing the parenting and child relationship to how God relates with us as our heavenly father, right? It's a picture of God's love uh, both in providing for us and in disciplining. Uh, So First off, in providing, there's a number of places we could go to talk about this. But in Matthew 7, uh, it talks about, uh, you know, this is uh, Jesus talking. He says, you though, even though you're evil, you know how to give good gifts to your children. So how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him, right? God actively provides for us, sustaining us, right, uh, each and every day uh, as a father, as a mother. Um, You know, same thing with disciplining. Um, God disciplines as parents discipline their children. Uh, And the reason why he reveals here um, in this next passage, for the Lord reproves him uh, whom he loves as a father, uh, the son in whom he delights. And so God brings about discipline in order to bring about the best in his children, uh, in order they might not experience pain, but live life to the full. Um, And really, all of this, you know, Paul is writing the book of Colossians, um, He also wrote the book of Ephesians. There's a very similar passage in Ephesians 6. And all of this that he's writing is really based, uh, he's drawing from the Ten Commandments. Um, And, you know, commandment four is honor your father and mother, right? So first three commandments really have to do with kind of our primary relationship with God, right? No idols, uh, worship God alone, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Uh, Number four is really uh, that relationship with your father and mother. Honor your father and mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Um, you know, and so not only love, which is to show uh, extreme affection and to do the best for our parental units, but also called to honor them, to esteem them highly, to hold them uh, in high regard uh, in, our, in many different ways. Um, honor can look like a number of different things. Honor can look like listening. Uh, you know, so actually 
hearing your parents and what they're saying to you and uh, learning from the wisdom that they have to give, right? Uh, it can look like submission or obedience, um, you know, actively uh, doing what they say. This is a hard one for us, right? We struggle with this one. Uh, you know, I mentioned Luke 2 here. Um, you know, if anybody could say, like, my parents are not as smart as me, it's Jesus, right? If anyone could go, like, I know better than my parents, it's probably Jesus, right? Um, there's a peculiar story early on in which Jesus is at the temple, and he, he kind of gets lost, and his parents, like, leave Jerusalem to go back home, and they don't notice for, like, a day that he's missing. So if you've ever lost your kid at the department store, like, you know, you're okay. It's just 15 minutes. Like, they lost Jesus for a day. <laughs> I'm just saying. Um, and uh, they go back and they find him, and he's like, didn't you know I had to be about my, my father's work? I had to be in the temple, whatever, right? And, um, you know, they're like, we were worried sick about you, all this stuff. But in the end, it says he submits to them uh, and their leadership and goes home. Even though he's God, yet he still honors uh, his earthly father and mother. Honoring also looks like uh, how we speak about our father and mother. Um, do we speak about them uh, highly? Do we do honor them in our speech in front of others? Uh, we don't speak harshly to them, right? Um, this is hard for us. Uh, honoring also looks like serving our parents, particularly as they, they get into old age. A lot of service is sort of required, right? And so God intends this to be sort of a beautiful picture uh, of uh, what he's doing for us, and he entrusts us to our, our parents' care. Um, Martin Luther, in his large catechism, uh, catechism is a book that instructs the basic principles of the faith. And in his large catechism, he says, We must therefore impress it upon the young that they should regard their parents as in God's stead, in his place, and remember that however lowly, poor, frail, and queer, odd they may be, nevertheless, they are f uh, father and mother given by God. They are not to be deprived of their honor because of their conduct or failings. And they're going to have some right? Um, you know, parents can be frustrating. My children tell me this often, so that's how I know. Uh, no, but we've all been there with our parents, right? We all have had frustrating times with our parents. I remember one specific time where, like, um, you know, we grew up in Texas, so, like, if they, there was, like, a dusting of snow that canceled everything, right? But we actually got, like, a couple inches of snow this one time, right? And, uh, you know, I wanted to go hang out with my friends on the snow day, right? And, um, and they're like, no, they wouldn't even let me drive, right? Because they were worried I'd get into some sort of accident or whatever. And I'm like, fine, I'll walk then. And they're like, they're like no, you can't walk either. You have to stay home. And I remember being so frustrated with them, right? Because they were really dumb, right? Um, you know, that, that's just kind of what we think. And, uh, you know, we, it can be challenging sometimes, these relationships. But we respect the office, uh, even though our parents are imperfect, right? Um, so... Um, we, we honor them as people that God has put in our lives for our good. Um, even though they will, as imperfect people, uh, have shortcomings in how they use their parental authority. Um, and so this is intended to be a beautiful picture, right? Which is why often if there's pain in the relationship with, with our parents, right, then that could be a significant source of pain for people, uh, especially if there's abuse, right? God is not condoning that or saying we need to ignore that uh, as he here teaches us the importance of honoring our parents. Um, but we have a problem with authority, do we not, right? As people, we don't really like it. Uh, we even kind of, uh, you know, in our culture today, we kind of honor people for sort of resisting authority, uh, right? Uh, we have an authority problem that traces back to Adam and Eve, right? Um, you know, if you look at, at them in the garden, right, uh, you know, they are tempted, they are deceived into taking charge of their own destiny a little bit, right? There's a, that desire in them, that, that pride in them to go, you know what, I would really like to call the shots here, right? Or, or I would like to at least call some of them. Um, that, that's kind of in us. We've got a little bit of that old Adam and Eve that's in us from the beginning, a desire for, for you know, us to be in charge, for us to do what we want and what we think is right. Um, and so we, we have a little authority problem. And it's not just with our, our parents, right? Uh, but often with the other authorities in our lives as well. Uh, the other major authority being the government. Um, and at the time of Jesus' incarnation, when he did ministry, um, you know, on earth, um, he encountered people who had a problem with the government as well. In fact, the, the Jewish culture at the time, they thought um, they hated their Roman overlords that uh, had sort of taken over their land and occupied it against their will for, you know, a number of, of years. 
and uh, they had sort of justified tax evasion. Uh, they, you know, they asked Jesus this question at one point because uh, they're trying to catch Jesus in his words and trick him, which, by the way, doesn't work out well, <laughs> so don't try it, right? Um, but they say, tell us what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not, right? And they're hoping to trick him, right? Because they're like, if he says yes, right, then he's sort of a, a traitor to the Jewish nation, uh, right? And, and if he says no, right, like then, then maybe he's not respecting uh, government or whatever else, right? Or he'll, he'll be, you know, people will hear about it and the authorities will come looking for him. Uh, but Jesus cuts right through like he always does, to the heart of the matter and gives a profound answer, right? He says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. That Jesus basically upholds that uh, government has a a use and a function that is valuable and important to us, right? Uh, God uses government for the good of all people. That he absolutely desires uh, through working through government to provide for people, to make sure that people are cared for, they are protected, uh, that justice is done, that wrongdoing uh, is punished, right? And that people are brought up in the ways that are right. Uh, that far from government being something that God doesn't use or is maybe God is, you know, sometimes we think he's only working through the church, but God also works powerfully through government uh, in order to, to bring about good for people. Um, in fact, in Romans, Uh, Paul elaborates on this. Um, He says, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Right? They don't give you trouble uh, for obedience, but for disobedience, disobeying the law. Uh, For the ruler is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, uh, not only to God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes. Uh, for the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. I don't know about you guys, but the authorities being ministers of God, like, I don't often see that, right? I'm not like paying my taxes and going, thank you for ministering to me, right? But here, God is sort of pointing out, right, we get services from government. We get protection from government, right? And that God desires um, that we have an orderly society for the good of all people and so that the gospel may flourish in that society as well, right? And so, um, you know, give, give what is owed, right? If it's taxes, if it's respect, if it is honor, give what is owed. That God desires for us uh, to lean in, to uh, support our government, uh, to pray for the government, that in the midst of that, uh, we can have a country in which the gospel is shared and people come to know God their Father, right? Um, now, this obviously, uh, this works really well. Um, you know, in, when government is, is doing really well, um, you know, in here, God is also, in other parts of Scripture, saying, right, if the government is unjust or is wanting you to do things against your faith, right, uh, that you don't have to do those things, right? So in Isaiah 10, uh, he talks about woe to those who make unjust laws, who issue oppressive decrees, right, who oppress people, right? Um, and all throughout Scripture, we have examples, right, of, of uh, what God-honoring resistance to um, injustice looks like. Uh, a few examples here would be the Hebrews, Hebrew midwives um, who refused to uh, kill the babies and, and uh, follow the Pharaoh's order. Uh, you got Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who kind of refused to worship uh, the king and were famously thrown into the fire, right? Uh, or Daniel who uh, prayed to God, which was illegal at the time, right? You've got Peter and John who um, in Acts 5 on the next uh, slide, they say, um, uh, we must obey God rather than people, right? And so God teaches us to honor our government uh, and, of course, that always, uh, we always have to take into account honoring God first, right? And so uh, we honor God and uh, we honor the government um, as well, right? And so this is uncomfortable for us because um, we've, we kind of, we don't like being subject to anyone, right? We like being our own boss, our own ruler, right? Um, but the real kicker is here is not always how we respond to authority, um, But how are we using the authority that's given to us? I think that's a really big question. Um, Sometimes we don't even consider the power and authority that we have been given uh, and that has been entrusted to us. And are we proving faithful in how we use that? 
in how we wield that uh, and in what manner are, are we wielding uh, that authority uh, that God has been giving us, right? So this is the second part of Colossians 3 that we're looking at today. So this would be verse 21, right, which starts, fathers, don't make your children resentful or they will become discouraged, right? That often parents can be a little too heavy-handed, uh, you know, that we can make our kids' lives miserable, right? If we're, if we're just getting on to them for things that annoy us and, and not necessarily things that are bad, right? That often, um, you know, we can, you know, and especially he singles out fathers here, right, that maybe are a little bit more prone to do this, right, um, to lead with selfish uh, desires or to lead with uh, emotions that are not, um, you know, checked uh, to make sure that we're, we're doing what is, what is faithful and honoring for our children, right? And, and this goes beyond parenting, right, uh, to all the authority in our lives, um, you know, it's, it's an easy example for parents, but we also have a lot of other authority, right? We have a lot of uh, relational and vocational authority that's been given to us, and we have difficulty wielding that as well, right? Whether it's with our, our parents or our children or our friends or our neighbors, our coworkers, our employees, uh, our, you know, whoever is in our lives, uh, we often have difficulty wielding it because we've got that, a little bit of that old Adam in us, right? A little bit of that desire to be in charge, a little bit of that desire to benefit from the authority we have personally, right? Um, you know, we get, the power goes to our head a little bit, right? Um, this is not unique to just you and me, but to all people, right? In, uh, in Luke, there's a, a story, right, in which, um, you know, Jesus uh, is asked, um, so he, he sends his disciples out to do work, and, and, and he goes out and does work, and they, um, you know, they come, uh, he sends messengers ahead of them. They went into a Samaritan village to arrange a place for him to stay, but the people didn't welcome him because he was on his way to Jerusalem. And James and John, his disciples, saw this, and they asked, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to burn them up? Like, that, that sounds a lot like Jesus, right? Like, you know, granted, Jesus does bring the law at times, but, you know, here, James and John, they're, they're letting the power go to the head, right? They started to figure out that being a j disciple of Jesus is a really cool thing, and you get to see cool, miraculous power at work, right? And they're like, hey, do you want us to do this too? We could smite them, right? And they're kind of letting it go to their head a little bit. They're not getting of what it means to fully follow Jesus. They're latching onto the power, but not the responsibility of what Jesus uh, came to do, right? And of course, Jesus corrects them, uh, right, for their error here. But it shows how prone we are to make things about us, to delight in the exercise of power, to delight in making others serve us or others miserable, or punishing others when we don't use the same measure to look at our own lives, right? Uh, we often do that. Um, in another passage in Matthew, uh, Jesus tells us, um, he says, you know that the rulers of the nations have absolute power over people and their officials have absolute authority over people. But that's not the way it's going to be among you. Whoever wants to become great among you will be your servant. Whoever wants to be most important among you will be your slave. It's the same way with the Son of Man. He didn't come so that others could serve him. Jesus came to serve and give his life as a ransom for many people. Right? And so Jesus, he, he tells this uh, section uh, right after, uh, you know, James and John's mom goes, hey, can they sit at your right hand in the kingdom of heaven, right? Can they have a place of honor and authority, right? And Jesus instead says, we shouldn't be concerned about honor and authority and wielding it over others, right? But instead, he says, I came to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many people that he doesn't use power the way we use power or authority the way that we use authority. Instead, Philippians 2.6 uh, says it really powerfully that says, although Jesus was in the form of God and equal with God, he was fully divine and fully human at the same time, right? He did not take advantage of his equality. He did not fully or consistently use his divine powers to his benefit or advantage, right? He, you don't see him smiting people over the place, which is what I would probably end up doing. Um, but on the contrary, he lays down um, himself. He humbles himself. He doesn't use everything at his disposal in order to suffer for our sake, right? And so Jesus, uh, instead of doing what we would do with power and authority, he uses us in order to uh, save people, 
He uses his power and authority to make our lives better for eternity, right? He goes to the cross, the ultimate example of a humble servant, to punish our sins, to lift the burden from us that we could not lift in order to once again reunite us with God the Father. Who, who has the arms wide open. We're all prodigals, and, and Jesus helps us uh, to go back uh, to receive the Father's love once again, that Jesus lays down his life so that that could be ours, our new reality. We could have life and have it to the full, uh, no longer controlled by sin, but instead uh, remade, reshaped once again into the image of God uh, to honor him and to do his will. That's what Jesus does with his power and authority is he saves, he rescues, right? And so for Jesus, authority doesn't mean I get the benefits or the exemptions on, I want, right? Authority isn't all about me and what I get out of it. Uh, it's not about me getting the perks, right? It's, it's not about me not having to go to that meeting or do that thing because I'm a big deal, right? Uh, or, you know, I don't have to obey the law of, of this, right? Because whatever. Uh, but instead, authority is about responsibility. And instead of getting it's about giving and about leading uh, by example. But that's a big part of what Jesus does is he shows us what it is like to truly uh, live as one who follows after the Father's heart and the, the Father's will, right? So in, in Genesis 1, we've got to think about this. How does God use power and authority? In Genesis 1, um, this is when the world is being created, right? And God said, let us make humans in our image, in our likeness, uh, let them rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the domestic animals over the earth, and all the animals that crawl on the earth, right? And let them rule over everything. This is the word I want to highlight. Because when we think of rulers and kings and authorities, I don't think we think the same thing that God is thinking. Because often we see abuses of power. I mean, is it hard for us to, to picture how power is abused in our society today? It is not. I mean, just, you know, the news for the past month or whatever, right, has been all about the abuse of power in our society and the pain that that has caused people, right? Um, when God says to rule, he, he doesn't mean, obviously, abuse of power. He doesn't uh, intend for us to interpret that as selfish power, uh, as, as we may be prone to rule. But God rules in a different way. He rules benevolently, caring for creation uh, in every way possible, sustaining creation, right? Uh, you know, he's telling humanity in ruling, he's saying, care for everything that I'm listing here. Care for this world which I'm giving you. That's how God uses authority, um, absolutely different than we would. So when, when we ask the question, how, how to does God use authority? We, we have our answer there, right? Uh, you know, we see it all throughout Scripture um, that God uses authority for our good and for our rescue, right? And he also imparts that authority to us. He empowers us with his authority. Um, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, very famous passage, obviously. Uh, it says, when Jesus came near, he spoke to them. He said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Stating fact, and so now he's going to go, therefore... And because of that, I'm going to transmit that to you. Wherever you go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to do everything I have commanded you. And remember that I am with, always with you uh, until the end of time, right? And so he imparts his authority to us, authority to proclaim his word, to make disciples, uh, to do the things which he did to become sort of little Christ, to become followers of, of him who now take on the responsibility of bringing God's grace to the world. Um, in Matthew 16, uh, this is one of the, the things that God gives us when he gives us his authority. He says, I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you imprison, God will imprison. And whatever you set free, God will set free. That God gives us the authority to forgive. That in this world, what this world desperately needs is the grace of God, the forgiveness of God. And he gives that authority to us to proclaim that, to speak it over people, not arbitrarily, uh, which would be a misinterpretation of this passage, but on behalf of God to speak and to go, yeah, here's the law. It convicts us of sin. If we don't know about it, we need to know about it, right? We need to have a good, honest um, understanding of, of who we are, right? Um, and yet, the main power that God wants us to be doing, that he wants us to leave with, is that power to forgive. 
uh, that power to announce what Jesus has done at the cross for each and every person, saying, this is yours in Christ. Um, and so as we look at today's passage, right, which is really about authority, whether it be parental authority, uh, vocational uh, authority like in, in your workplace or whatever organizations you're a part of, authority in the church, right, that we're not called to use authority uh, for our own selfish needs. We're not called, obviously, to uh, take advantage of it, but instead to fully utilize it as a gift of God in order to be the salt and light in, in the world. And so the question for you today is, what authority do you have? What power do you have in your relationships, um, in your vocations, uh, in the places that you find yourself, in the people that you surround yourself with? What authority and power do you have? It may not look like the boss-employee relationship, but often uh, we do have influence in a number of different ways. And how are we using that? Is it to our glory or to God's glory? And when we uh, come down on people or when we say things, is it a selfish need in there or is it truth and love, which is really what it should be whenever we use power or authority to convict? Um, but in, instead, let us not listen to the old Adam, the old Eve in us that wants to call the shots. But instead, acknowledging the grace given to us because Jesus uh, became incarnate and redeemed us uh, and, and knowing that God now helps us. He, he brings us into his plan, right? So this plan from the beginning of the world to redeem humanity, to restore humanity, and to one day totally redeem and restore the world and make it good as he originally intended in the very beginning, we get to be a part of that plan. We have an important role to play. Uh, we get to be a part of sharing that grace, of bringing about the kingdom of God, of bringing about his gracious rule in hearts and minds uh, so that all people can experience life and have it to the full. Um, as we hear in Spider-Man, great power comes with great responsibility, right? Thank you, Spider-Man, for the ethics lesson. But uh, truly, that God has called us to be people who wield authority not for the power and not to get a kick out of it calling down fire on people, but instead, uh, may our joy be to be, bring forgiveness to hearts and minds and to become a servant like Jesus, to be people who yield even our very lives, not seeking after everything we could seek after, but instead humbling ourselves, uh, taking on the form of a servant, the form of our Savior Jesus, in order to bring about his grace in this world. We pray.